Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So we're seeing a bit of a red day today, guys. XRP trading at about 88 and a half cents. Um, you can see we're getting rejected off this level here. Let me throw Fibonacci here on the daily real quick. Um, so you can see, based on this latest trend we saw for XRP, right, we hit a intra-year high of about $1.96, uh, came down to that 65 cent level, and uh, now you can see we're hovering just below the 0.236, uh, we are finding resistance up here, and yesterday it seemed like we were doing okay, we were getting above that dollar mark, um, you know, and then we kind of slipped down to the 90s, but guys, you got to remember the rest of the cryptocurrency market is also having a bit of a red day today, uh, the market cap is at about $1.5 trillion, uh, Bitcoin dominance still holding at about 43%. But guys, look at this. Everything in the red right now. Bitcoin down 8.7%. Ethereum down 10.4%. Uh, Binance coin down 12.3%. Cardano 12.5%. XRP 13.7%. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Pretty much everything is in the red at this moment in time. So, uh, you know, it's not just XRP. Bitcoin is also struggling to get out of this demand zone or level of support. So we are seeing, uh, you know, the entire cryptocurrency market in a bit of a struggle at this moment. Is this a sign for things to get even worse? Well, guys, I'm gonna zoom out here on the XRP chart. This is XRP on the daily. Uh, and I'm gonna take this fractal pattern from 2017, superimpose it here, uh, demonstrating that we are following, you know, what's looking like a very close replication of what happened in 2017. Now, I mean, uh, earlier on in this fractal pattern, we saw the timeline was matching up quite succinctly, but we know time is always one of the more difficult factors to predict. Uh, nevertheless, we can see levels matching up, right? So uh, if we take this here, and this is actually not lined up perfectly, if I line it up directly to the top there, uh, we can see uh, and, and this fractal too, by the way, does not show wicks and tails. So we can see though, we did come down in this level uh, and that does match up with this fractal pattern. We could even see another dip down to this level at about 75, 80 cents before we break out and move our way to the upside. So it's gonna be once we start to see these higher lows uh, consistently, that we will likely move to the upside. Of course, this also forms that Nike swoosh pattern that I mentioned the other day. So let me just get rid of that. And uh, you guys can see over here, we are coming back down. So is this just going to be temporary? Again, we could likely range in this zone for a while before we break out. Uh, you know, this pattern here back from 2017, if we took the equivalent time frame and matched it up today, this would take us uh, out to November of 2021. So uh, something to pay attention to. The levels though, guys, those are the more important uh, points to pay attention to, right? Getting below 80 cents, closing below 80 cents, that's what we don't want. That's certainly what we don't want. But you know, fluctuations back and forth, this is very normal. We know in the cryptocurrency space, the narrative has indeed changed. Let me bring this up guys from El Crypto King, JP Morgan CEO says, stay away from Bitcoin. So, you know, there was the 180 and now I feel like he's doing a 360. He's going back to what he was talking about back in 2017. So when asked by Republican Congressman Warren Davidson about how his views on Bitcoin have changed during a May 27th House Financial Services Committee hearing, JP Morgan CEO JB Diamond said that they in fact hadn't changed much. My own personal advice to people is to stay away from it. Uh, that does not mean the clients don't want it. This goes back to how you have to run a business. I don't smoke marijuana, but if you make it nationally legal, I'm not going to stop our people from banking it. So I don't tell people how to spend their money. Allowing his customers to uh, invest in Bitcoin yet, Jamie Dimon uh, ideologically does not believe in Bitcoin. I'm, I'm guessing maybe then his, uh, his views haven't really changed much. Um, so that was his opinion on this. And, um, you know, of course, we're hearing this narrative change in the space, that green narrative moving to a green, more clean cryptocurrency. Uh, well, Martin Volk tagged me in this, and I thought I'd bring this to your attention. Transaction A costs 951.58 kilowatt hours. Transaction B costs 0 0.0079 kilowatt hours. 90% of transaction A is green energy. 10% is not. Transaction A is 1,200,431.65 times more energy intensive than transaction B. And so he tagged a bunch of us in this uh, and he wrote, I know you guys know this, but maybe you can make it clear to your subscribers. Bitcoin is A and XRP is B. So, you know, th this, th this is just the math behind, <laughs> the math behind the realism of what we are going through, of what the world is seeing right now in terms of uh, energy usage and cryptocurrency mining. 
And, you know, the narrative is changing because we're coming out of this pandemic and, you know, there hasn't been much going on in terms of industry. And uh, I think we already have kind of put the brakes on energy consumption to a degree in the Western world and, uh, you know, in emerging economies as well, I guess I should say. And governments of the world are saying, look, we cannot really go back to the old way that we used to do business. It was too harmful for the environment. And so, you know, we want to use cryptocurrency. But how do we, um, how can we morally, you know, be able to do this without just ruining the environment even more? And so, um, you know, once they can get this math around their head that, of course, Bitcoin, not the answer. And, uh, you know, now even trading Bitcoin, uh, you know, there's this idea that some people only want energy or, or rather sustainably mined Bitcoin. So this is going to play a major role, I think, in economies moving forward and uh, industry. Um, you know, coming out of this pandemic, things are going to change, guys. And I know we're not back to 100%. I know in some countries, maybe they're at 80, 85. In other countries, maybe we're at 60, 65%. Other countries are still experiencing high rates of infection. And so we're kind of all over the map. But guys, coming out of this, this is where it's going to be. So I wanted to thank Martin for posting that. Uh, another point here, the Bank of Canada says its digital currency will be greener than Bitcoin. So uh, this from XRP Crypto Wolf. Canada, as some of you may know, is uh, looking into a CBDC, though the Bank of Canada doesn't plan on launching its digital currency just yet. The central bank's deputy governor, Timothy Lane, already promises that the project will be much greener than Bitcoin. According to Penticton Western News, Lane said that the new currency would rely on the already existing trust in Canada's fiat currency, including its potentially, or rather its potential environmental impact. Instead of trusting a proof of work consensus algorithm used by Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, citizens would trust their central bank much as they always have, he said. Uh, that of course means that we wouldn't have to rely on those environmentally very wasteful methods of mining technologies that we've seen with cryptocurrencies. Uh, so this coming out of the Bank of Canada, we already know, of course, uh, the Bank of Canada has partnered with RippleNet. Uh, we've heard about the Project Ubin, Project Jasper connection that happened with, uh, I believe it was Canada and Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. There have been trials going on there, Bank of Canada partnering up with Ripple uh, years ago now. And uh, so this doesn't have to do with Ripple, but uh, I think that the Bank of Canada and the government of Canada really do understand this idea of, um, you know, an environmentally friendly narrative moving forward with technology, but being responsible at the same time. So I wanted to thank XRP Crypto Wolf uh, for posting that. I also saw this guy's big tech, not cryptocurrency, is the real threat to central banks. This coming from the Danish central bank governor. So what does he have to say? Lars Rode, the governor of the country's central bank, doesn't see the rise of crypto trading as a serious economic threat. Uh, I could be tempted to ignore it, he told Bloomberg. I think the term currency is badly used here. Most currencies store value and are means of transaction. There is no stability, no guarantee about the value of cryptocurrencies. Crypto is a speculative asset at best. So he is likening the crypto market to, um, you know, something more akin to stock trading. Uh, and he's saying, you know, these cryptocurrencies don't have any value. He is really differentiating between, I guess, uh, traditional fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. So then when he was asked about the central bank's move to reduce speculative rivalry from crypto, he admitted he is more watchful of major tech companies moves in the payment field. Uh, big tech's invasion of the currency area is much more interesting. So is he eyeing companies like Ripple and cryptocurrencies like XRP uh, for real world utility. It does sound like he is. Here's a quote. If tech giants get a hold on the means of transaction, then that could be a real threat to the autonomy and independence of central banks. I've always thought this too, right? You know, Ripple could have come in and basically dominated the landscape. And I think that, you know, way back in 2018, that was kind of what we were hoping slash thinking they would do. But I think it's come to, um, I think it's become very clear now that Ripple obviously wants to work with banks. They don't want to, I mean, they, they want to be disruptors in the technological sense, but they don't want to come in and dominate the industry. They want to be able to help banks leverage their technology to better facilitate payments, especially when there are going to be disruptors in the coming from the crypto space, right? There are already, and I think Libra was a really good example right at the beginning, when they wanted to come in, introduce their dollar, and not really care about how the financial system works currently, they were gonna kind of steamroll in 
and just uh, introduce their currency, deploy it to the people and say, here, have at it. You can use our currency and you can use Facebook and probably we would create a, um, you know, some sort of secure application within the Facebook app or whatever to be able to, uh, to, be, to be able to buy and sell things on our marketplace or wherever. And, uh, you know, governments around the world were like, whoa, 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 you cannot do that. And so, you know, I think there are going to be companies like that that are going to try to uh, flip the system on its head. And Ripple is that option for banks. And so, you know, whereas governments before were kind of scared of cryptocurrency and not really understanding why they needed Ripple, Ripple is giving them that solution in order to be able to act and process payments like a cutting edge cryptocurrency company without having to really change much on their end. So Lars Rode of the Danish Central Bank uh, also realizing that this is uh, what he should be paying attention to, as uh, should many heads of government, in my opinion. Uh, Denmark was one of the earliest countries to explore the possibility of central bank digital currencies. The Denmark's National Bank discarded the idea following a one-year study in 2016-2017. Who knows if they will uh, revisit that? Of course, that was several years ago now. Anyway, wanted to thank Michael at Val5Links for posting that. The narrative continues, of course, with green cryptocurrency as El Crypto King posts this about Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary. Here's what he had to say during a Friday appearance on the T. A Ameritrade Network, cryptocurrency skeptic turned investor Kevin O'Leary has questioned the pervasive narrative that Bitcoin is seeing strong institutional adoption. He's calling that BS. The Canadian entrepreneur who is famous for co-hosting the hit show Shark Tank claims that actual institutions are not into Bitcoin yet due to environmental concerns. So... Here's the thing, institutions want to make money, and if their clients want to trade Bitcoin, they have been open to allowing Bitcoin trading on their platforms, and I think that that's what we've been hearing about uh, up till now. But in terms of adoption, in terms of actual using cryptocurrency for solving problems, nobody is doing that with Bitcoin, and, for, and, and this is what Kevin O'Leary is calling out, essentially. He's saying, you know, institutional adoption, I call BS on that. He says, that's BS. They are not yet. There is no institution out there, any sovereign or pension plan that's doing it yet because they are not over the ESG issues. Uh, they need sustainability. O'Leary adds that Bitcoin's biggest issue is its carbon footprint, which has not been resolved yet for institutions. Yet he expects that they could accelerate Bitcoin's path to sustainability if institutions get involved. Katie, bar the doors. That's what you are betting on. So institutions also uh, jumping on board, whether they are pressured to or not, um, because of course, ideologically, everybody's got a different view on how environmentally friendly uh, businesses need to be or legally should be, etc. I don't want to get into that debate, but the elephant in the room right now is that Bitcoin is an energy hog and institutions are just not going to adopt it at the same rate. Uh, as other uh, more environmentally friendly cryptocurrencies, I think. And uh, for payments especially, nobody's going to be using Bitcoin. So as reported by you today, O'Leary said that he did not want to own coins with a bad provenance, particularly the ones mined in China. The entrepreneur says that it has to be mined ethically. Uh, picking up on the narrative pushed by Bitcoin proponents, O'Leary says that Bitcoin can advance green energy with miners on the cutting edge of renewable resources. So uh, more news there, guys. Uh, just pushing this green narrative forward. And this is new news, right, coming out every single day. And I feel like over the last few days now, I've been talking about this green narrative and how it kind of just shifted on a dime. Maybe we're just hearing about it more because maybe it's just being reported about more in the news. But um, I don't know if you've noticed it, but I've noticed it. Maybe it's because I do this every single day. Uh, anyway, want to keep going here, guys. I thought this was interesting. Toda Averdade here posting this on Twitter. Calling out Coinbase. Coinbase, he says, So you don't allow trading of XRP, but you charge XRP for issuing the Your Debit Card. Just tell us then, when will you relist XRP? So it is interesting. In the United States, as you guys uh, may know, Coinbase has uh, delisted XRP, as have uh, many exchanges, uh, just due to the SEC lawsuit. But here, they're saying you can get your Coinbase card. You just need to make a one-time payment. This is taken from your Coinbase crypto balance make sure one of your btc eth ltc bch xrp and other wallets has enough to cover the issuance cost so they are willing to accept xrp as noted here yet they are not willing 
to relist XRP quite yet. Of course, um, we do have to remember Coinbase is an exchange that uh, has clients all over the world, so not just in the United States. So it could be for certain clients. I'm not sure if this uh, is specifically for European clients. As you guys can see, uh, it is a one-time payment of 4.95 euros, so uh, not sure if that has anything to do with it. Nevertheless, interesting observation there. Uh, more Ripple news, guys. So this from Wrath of Kahneman, a journal article that was just published this month, uh, talks about blockchain technologies status and implementation in Oman. I know we talked about uh, some news with regards to Ripple that was occurring in Oman. Well, here's a document with regards to another study, blockchain technology status of implementation in Oman. Now, they mentioned Ripple here a few times, and we've heard about these partnerships in the past, right? The Kuwait Financial House, uh, they mentioned Ripple here. It implemented this technology in instant cross-border remittance services using Ripple's blockchain technology. So mentioning several Middle Eastern countries here. If I go down here, uh, Ripple and BSS is in collaboration with Oman's Banking Association as well for blockchain projects. As the next important step towards a comprehensive e-Oman government, the establishment of the Omani Information Technology and Communications Group has been advertised by the Ministry Ministry of Transport and Communications. And then down here in this chart, we have Ripple also mentioned Ripple's blockchain technology uh, under the closed and implemented section here of this chart. Uh, they also mention R3's Corda platform. So, you know, of course, talking about DLT and uh, comparing platforms. Bank Dofar joined with Ripple for instant payments right over here. Recently, Bank Dofar had announced its usage of Ripple for cross border payments, as we had uh, mentioned in a former video. Uh, as the first bank in Oman utilizing the Ripple Net, the worldwide corporate blockchain network convenient for money order services. And then down here, finally, in this uh, final table, we have some participants, including Bank Dofar and RippleNet. So this sounds like it's uh, not just regarding Oman, but several Middle Eastern countries uh, mentioned in this document. Guys, I will link this PDF in the description of this video if you guys are interested to read further. Wrath of Kahneman also mentions here, Ripple is noted in a few places, as I just pointed out, unlike other cryptos like BTC, only mentioned in the introduction, almost as a category. The article subtly suggests Ripple is finding real implementation. Uh, and he also notes that Corda also makes an appearance, as we saw. So uh, really good to note this. You know, of course, Ripple really has been making waves in the Middle East and uh, has been implementing RippleNet with several banks in that region. Wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for posting that. And this just in, guys, the cryptic poet saying Ripple partner Ria Money Transfer teams up with Mooney unlocking payments access to 45,000 point of sale and nationwide retail networks in Italy. So here's the news with regards to that. New agreement agreement expands Ria Money's international partner distribution capabilities through its partnership-led growth strategy. So Ria Money, a global leader in the cross-border money transfer industry and subsidiary of Euronet Worldwide, today announced the expansion of its distribution network through a strategic collaboration with Mooney, one of Italy's foremost proximity banking and payment companies. Uh, this partnership enables Ria to deliver its key principles of convenience, simplicity, and value for money to Mooney's nationwide coverage in Italy. And uh, back in 2019, I don't know if you guys remember this. I remember reporting on this. Ripple partners with RIA Money Transfer to power instant global payments. So just another partnership here and RIA expanding their services in Italy. So great Ripple partner news there coming out of Italy. And I'm going to touch on this SEC news as well. This pretty much means one of the SEC freaks is quitting his job because he knows how effed his reputation will be if he keeps playing along with the crooked, corrupt SEC agenda. This coming from Minus Wells here on Twitter. He knows just like the rest of us that in the end, Ripple wins. So what is this referring to? Well, the Cryptic Poet also posted this article here. SEC attorney moves to withdraw from the Ripple case. So Dugan Bliss or Duggan Bliss, senior trial counsel at the SEC, is seeking the court's permission to withdraw from the Ripple case. The attorney says he is leaving the agency after spending over 10 years there. After Bliss's departure, the SEC will be represented by the remaining counsel, George Tenriero, Daphna Waxman, John Daniels, and others. The litigation process is being supervised by the SEC attorney, uh, Preethi Krishnamurthy. The Ripple case is still in its pretrial discovery phase, as reported by you today, and the SEC is now seeking to expand the number of depositions. So uh, more information here with regard to the details of the case. I find it interesting, Dugan Bliss, now leaving now, I mean, it could have just been that his time was up, but in the middle of a case, think about this for a second, you're in the middle of a case. I mean, maybe he got a better opportunity somewhere else, but I mean, how does that look, really? I mean, you're just dropping everything in the middle of a case, and not only that, in the middle of one of the biggest cases I'm sure the SEC has on their docket at present time. So, is he bailing? 
because he doesn't want to be associated with a negative result. I mean, at first when I read this tweet up here from Minus Wells, I was like, ah, you know, he's probably just moving on. But then, you know, when I started thinking about it, putting the pieces together, who just bails in the middle of a case? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I would think that that would be a pretty big deal. Any lawyers in the audience, put your comment down in the comment section if you might have some insight on that. Um, well, you know what, Jeremy Hogan, Brings up an interesting point here. The SEC's motion to strike Ripple's fair notice defense is the most important motion of the case thus far. And look whose name is on the reply brief. Benjamin Hanauer, the new lawyer out of Chicago. So Jeremy Hogan retweeting out James Fillin's tweet here with regards to this. And uh, for those of you guys who do not remember, uh, Benjamin Hanauer, uh, I believe he was the one who has the expertise in settlements. And so when he joined the SEC... You know, people in the XRP community were getting excited. Look, are we going to see a settlement sooner rather than later? Especially since uh, this guy specializes in crafting complex settlements. I don't have his bio up here, but I did talk about it in a video I did uh, several weeks ago now. Jeremy Hogan down here saying, I just read it briefly, but I already see that it mischaracterizes the kick interactive affirmation defense as an Upton defense, when in fact it was a void for vagueness defense. Uh, and even when the judge didn't strike it from the pleadings at this stage of litigation, good Luck SEC. Justin Kimball asking Jeremy Hogan, so how long does a judge usually take to decide a motion? And Jeremy Hogan responds, depends on the motion. In federal court, about a week up to a month. Johnny Crypto asking, please explain why that matters. And Jeremy Hogan responding, looks like the new attorney has been put in charge of the case. Meaning Benjamin Hanauer, the lawyer who has a specialty in crafting complex settlement deals, the new lawyer that the SEC has just gotten on board, coincidentally Dugan Bliss is now leaving the SEC. So I mean, is the writing on the wall, does Dugan Bliss see something that he doesn't want to be associated with? Meanwhile, the SEC likely realizing, look, we're in deep water, we better get this sorted out sooner rather than later. And as we're seeing this green crypto narrative strengthen, is the US government realizing we need something to keep on top of our competition. We need to be able to implement a new financial strategy coming out of this pandemic. I mean, Canada's already doing it, the Bitcoin narrative obviously going down the toilet. So tell me down in the comments what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.